understand how algorithms are analyzed to get the time complexity. You need to understand how to analyze basic program constructs such as selection and loops. We will start with the selection statements. And here, we will cover two types of if statements. The first type will be a single if statement that does not have else part. And the second type will be if and then with else statement. So let us consider the single if statement. And as you know, that it consists of a condition followed by a statement if the condition is a true. So if the condition is a true, then the time complexity is equal to the time spent executing the condition. And as we discussed before, it is considered equal to one unit of time plus the time spent in executing the statement. So here we say that the time complexity Tn is equal to the time spent for executing the condition, which is equal to one, plus the time spent for executing the statement. And now for the condition, it is possible that it consists of a complex statement that consists of many operations. These operations might be addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and so on. But all of these operations will be ignored and the condition will be considered as one comparison statement that requires one unit of time. And now for the statement. It is possible that the statement also consists of another if and else, or maybe single if, or maybe a loop. So we need to analyze this part and find the time complexity for Ts of n. Now if the condition is false, then the time complexity will be only the time spent executing the condition, and will be equal to 1. Now for the if then else statement, we have the condition, the statement P if the condition is true, and the statement Q if the condition is false. For the if then else statement, you need to find the time complexity of both the statements P and the Q. Because according to the result of the condition, the time complexity is either equal to the time spent executing the statement P if the condition is true, or equal to the time spent executing the statement Q if the condition is false. But when analyzing the algorithm, you don't know which statement will be executed. That depends on the result of the condition. Therefore, you need to find the time complexity of both the statements P and the Q, then select the maximum between them. So as a result, Tn is equal to the time for testing the condition, plus the maximum time between the time of executing both the statements P and the Q independently. Since you need to find the time complexity of both the statements P and the Q, suppose you want to apply the quick analysis, then it is not necessary that the basic operation is the same when analyzing the statements P and the Q. That depends on the content of both the statements. Let me give you an example. Consider the following algorithm. If the condition is a true, then we have an assignment statement that has the multiplication operation, and we have a for loop that has a single assignment statement that has the addition operation. So where is the basic operation? The basic operation is the addition because it is executed more than the multiplication operation. Now if the condition is false, we have an assignment statement that has the addition operation, and we have a for loop that has a single assignment statement that consists of the multiplication operation. So what is the basic operation? The basic operation is the multiplication because it is executed more than the addition operation. After finishing from selection, now we turn our discussion to loops. To analyze loops, we will first consider single loops, then we will cover nested loops. We will start with a single for loop, and as you know, it consists of three parts. Initializing the loop variable, in our case here it is called i. Testing for the condition to stop the loop. And finally incrementing the loop variable in every iteration. To find the number of iterations of the loop, we use summations. 
especially if the condition of the loop is depending on a value of a variable. So how to find such summations? Let us first begin reviewing the necessary formulas and rules of summations before we answer this question. In this for loop, the variable controlling the loop is i. For any loop, if the variable controlling the loop is increased or decreased by 1, we call it simple iterator. So i is a simple iterator. And as you know that inside the for loop we have a statement that is executed the number of times of the iterations of the for loop. So basically we need to count how many times s is executed which is equal to the number of iterations of the for loop. So we can find this number by using summation because you know that in the summation the variable is increased by 1. So we say that the running time is equal to the summation. The variable i will start from a, it ends at b, and we are adding unity for every value of i. And this is equal to 1 plus 1 plus 1 until the end. So this first one when i is equal to a, the second one when i is equal to a plus 1, and so on the last one when i is equal to b. So the question is how many times we are adding 1? The answer is simply equal to b minus a plus 1. b is the last value of i, a is the first value of i plus 1. So this is the formula for using summation over unity. Now what if we have a loop that is counting down, not counting up? And you know still we will have a simple iterator, but it is counting down. So we can use the same summation, because you know that addition is commutative, so x plus y is equal to y plus x. Now what if the variable controlling the loop is not a simple iterator. I mean, what if the value of i is not increased by 1 or decreased by 1? As an example, what if it is increased by 2? But this cannot happen if we have a for loop. It could happen if we have a while loop. So let us consider the following example. So suppose we have a variable i. Its initial value is 1. And we have a while loop that goes up to 9. In every iteration, we are executing the statement s, and we are adding the value of i by 2. So the loop iterator is not simple because in every iteration, it is increased by 2. So how to find the number of iterations in this while loop? We say that tm is equal to the summation, and we need here to list all values of i that are received by the condition in every iteration because the condition of the loop will decide when to stop the loop. So in the beginning, the value of i is equal to 1. Then it will be equal to 3, because in the next iteration, the first value of i is 1 plus 2 is equal to 3. Next will be equal to 5, 7, and finally will be equal to 9, and the loop will stop. In every iteration, the statement s is executed once. So this summation is not a standard because it does not have an end value and also the variable i is not increased by 1. But we can evaluate and find the answer of this summation. This is equal to 1 when i is equal to 1 plus 1 when i is equal to 3 plus 1 when i is equal to 5 and for the rest of values of i. And this is equal to 5 because we are adding 1 5 times. And 5 is the number of iterations of the while loop. So now how to turn this non-standard summation into a standard summation? To do this, we need to observe the value of i and get a formula as a pattern for the value of i. Since the values of i represents odd numbers, then the value of i is either equal to an equation 2k plus 1 or 2k minus 1. 
We can use any of them to translate the non-standard summation into a standard summation. Let me show you how. Now, for the first case, let's say 4 i is equal to 2k plus 1. And as you know that i starts from 1 and it ends when equal to 9. So when i starts from 1, so we have 2k plus 1 is equal to 1. So the value of k is equal to 0. And when i is equal to 9, so we have 2k plus 1 equal to 9. 2k is equal to 8. So k is equal to 4. So we say that tn is equal to the summation that starts from 0 up to 4. And we are executing this statement once in every iteration. So we have 1. And this is equal to 4 minus 0 plus 1 which is equal to 5, which is the same answer we have obtained with the non-standard summation. Now for i equal to 2k minus 1. So we say for i equal 2k minus 1. i is equal to 1 and i is equal to 9. Solving for these two values, we have 2k minus 1 is equal to 1. So 2k is equal to, so k is equal to 1. And for 2k minus 1 equal to 9, we have 2k is equal to 10, so k is equal to 5. So tn is equal to the summation that starts from 1 up to 5, and the statement s is executed once in every iteration, and this is equal to 5 minus 1 plus 1, which is equal to 5, and again we have obtained the same answer. So what does the value of k represent? The value of k represents the number of iterations of the loop. So here we can conclude that k is the number of iterations of the loop. And the last thing for reviewing the summation is to consider the arithmetic and geometric summations. For the arithmetic summation, it is i equal 1 up to n for i, it is equal to n times n plus 1 over 2. And for the geometric summation, it starts from 0 up to n minus 1, r raised to power i, and this is equal to r raised to power n minus 1 over r minus 1. We might use these summations for the analysis of some of the loops. But notice that the summation is not adding 1. It is adding i for the arithmetic summation, and it is adding a power function for the geometric summation. Now how to express the number of times each part of the for loop is executed by a summation formula? First is initializing the loop variable i, that is assigning the value a to i. This statement is an assignment statement and executed only once before entering the loop. So number of assignments is equal to 1. Second is evaluating the loop condition. The condition is tested for every iteration, plus one more test for exiting the loop. And this can be formulated as a summation that goes from a to b plus 1. We have 1 in the summation because we are making one comparison per iteration of the for loop. Next is executing the statement s and incrementing the value of i by 1 inside the loop. And this happens in every iteration of the loop. Hence, number of times the statement s is executed can be formulated as a summation that goes from a to b and we have one in the summation because the statement is assumed to be executed only once in every iteration. A number of increments of the value of i can be also formulated as a summation that goes from a to b and one in the summation because we make one increment per iteration of the for loop. Now we turn our focus on analyzing nested for loops. Assume the outer loop goes from A to B using the iterator i. 
and the inner loop goes from C to D using the iterator J. Similar to single for loop, for nested loops, every loop is formulated by a summation. I mean, if we have nested loops, then these loops are formulated as nested summations. Let us go over each part of these loops and formulate them by summations. First is counting the number of assignments. In the outer loop, it is executed only once. And in the inner loop, it is executed once for every iteration of the outer loop. Hence, the number of assignments is equal to 1 plus the summation of 1 that goes from A to B, that is the number of iterations of the outer loop. Second is counting the number of tests, I mean number of comparisons when evaluating the condition of these two nested loops. Let us first look at the outer loop. For the outer loop, the number of tests is equal to the number of iterations plus 1 for exiting the loop. And this can be formulated as a summation of 1 that goes from A to B plus 1. Now for the inner loop, its condition is tested in every iteration of the loop plus 1 for exiting the loop. And since this happens in every iteration of the outer loop, then the number of tests for the inner loop is formulated by nested summations. The first summation goes from A to B, that is the number of iterations of the outer loop, and the second summation goes from C to D plus 1, that is the number of iterations of the inner loop plus one test for exiting the loop. Next is counting the number of increment operations. For the outer loop, increment is made in every iteration. Therefore, number of increments is formulated by a summation of 1 that goes from A to B. Now for the inner loop, increment is made in every iteration. This happens in every iteration of the outer loop. So the number of increment operations is formulated by nested summations. First summation goes from A to B, that is the number of iterations of the outer loop. Second summation goes from C to D, that is the number of iterations of the inner loop. Finally, since the statement S is executed the same number of times as the increment operation of the inner loop, then we can use the same summations for the number of increments of the inner loop as the number of times the statement S is executed. After understanding how to analyze the basic program constructs and how to formulate number of times loops are iterated by summations, we will give you in the next lesson some examples showing you how to evaluate these summations and get a formula in terms of the problem size that represents the efficiency of the algorithm.